All right, thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming out again. Um, this has been a really productive time, I feel like, for the neighborhood with everybody coming together. And I'm so glad that all parties are here tonight. It's, it's been really awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm going to take care of a few of the Tobin Hill Community Association housekeeping things. Um, this is normally when we would meet, so uh, we just kind of lumped it in to here. Um, I, uh, I want to let y'all know the purpose of this meeting is to discuss solutions to the violence and neg negative activity emanating from the Strip and how it impacts Tobin Hill residents, and we want to discuss that with the uh, North St. Mary's Bar Club owners. Um, so um, I'm very grateful that it looks like most of them are here tonight. I, um, and for it to be on St. Patty's Day, that's awesome, you know? So. <laughs> um, uh, we have a new board. Um, most of them are here tonight. Uh, Eric Trevino, he's our vice president. He's a co-owner of Sings. Uh, Rick Shell, our treasurer, who's right over here. Uh, Heidi Patterson couldn't be here tonight. She's our secretary. Um, Alfonso Rowland, um, I don't believe he's here right now. He's a resident. Uh, Paula Starnes, she's a resident. And Lynn Canapi, she's a uh, business member. She's right over here. So, uh, this is the original. Uh, logo and font in Tobin Hill Community Association. You know, a lot of this doesn't apply to a lot of people in here, but um, we're considering updating it with our new website um, to something uh, that we feel you know reflects the modern neighborhood and uh, but still kind of ties into the craftsman style homes, the Art Deco features of the neighborhood. Um, and this would be the the new logo. Um, so we're think we're we're going to put this to a vote through the association and uh, gather people's feedback. And uh, when we launch the new site, we're hoping to launch with uh, a decision on this. Uh, the new website launch is uh, dated for uh, April fourth, two thousand twenty. Um, it uh, it's going to be a completely new site. Uh, it's it's going to be very functional. Uh, you can pay and manage your membership online. Uh, it's going to have a lot of features the old website didn't uh, have. And for one, it's just going to work. Which I think it's going to work. <laughs> All right, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Stacy Jones up here for um, some updates. Um, I'm Stacey Jones. I am your D1 representative for Tobin Hill. Uh, the councilman should be here in the next five, six minutes. Um, we actually have a lot of the city departments here to discuss the, needs, the construction that's going on, the police substation that is happening, the noise ordinance task force. Um, so right now, David McBeth wants to come on up here. And thank you, Stacey. Good, good evening, everyone. My name is David McBeth. I'm Assistant City Engineer for Public Works for the City of San Antonio. And uh, in case you didn't notice, there's a little bit of construction going on in St. Mary Street. I know it's hard to notice, but it's out there. Um, and we uh, just appreciate your patience. Uh, we are probably about, you know, almost halfway through. We started about a year ago on the construction. Of course, a lot of the work that we're doing now is utility construction. That's the underground work that has to happen uh, so that we don't come back two years later and have to cut the street again with saws or CPS. So uh, I will tell you that uh, all the gas work up and down the entire corridor, that all three phases have been complete. Uh, we are working on the second phase of the sanitary sewer work, which involves uh, some pretty deep sanitary sewer, large sewer lines that are having to be upgraded and replaced. Uh, and using a bypass system to be able to do that. Uh, so that work continues. Uh, we have also worked with a contractor to try to accelerate some of the work by working in two different phases of the water work. So we're doing water and sewer now. Uh, I would say that probably uh, around the summertime, we should be wrapping up some of the utility work uh, and then start to see some of the road, the, the nice work, the road work uh, that'll happen uh, and all the new, new sidewalks the new paving, uh, reconstructing the roadway, um, and that should all happen. And right now, our, our 
schedule shows us finishing in about March of uh, this next year. So about another year, I know that's a long time, but, but uh, once we get through it, I think we're gonna really like it. Another thing I wanted to, to add to that too is uh, late last year, the Midtown Tours uh, awarded about $2.5 million in additional funding for some streetscape and, and landscape amenities along the corridor. Uh, so we we got that money uh, through the council in December. We're working with the contractor and our design team to try to accelerate a design plan to incorporate uh, some pedestrian lighting uh, up and down the entire corridor uh, to include some landscaping where we can squeeze that in. Uh, and also uh, some other amenities, trash cans, uh, bike racks, things like that. So uh, that's going to be included in the project as well. Um, so with that, uh, that's that's it for the St. Mary's project. And you also, uh, one of the other projects I'm, I'm not quite as familiar with, but it's one of the, our, our architectural team is working with a design build contractor to build a new substation down at the, the south end of St. Mary's. Uh, they're near Josephine and, and uh, Locust and Grayson. Um, we have a, a, a contractor and a design built team under contract. They are working on design plans and uh, should be going to construction sometime later this year. I apologize, I don't have that exact date, but that work is ongoing and is part of the 2017 bond program. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I have a quick one. Sure. So I pretty much roam the streets all over the place. Uh, people know who I am. So one of my complaints only is, how about getting the spout glass signs off the sidewalks we just got on French? Because there's people with kids and strollers and stuff that are at risk of walking down the street. Sidewalks and, blocking, uh, signs that are blocking, blocking the sidewalks, okay. Yeah, we'll deal with our construction team on that to just do a, a good quick check tomorrow to make sure we're not you know, we have to have signage up to, to guide people through the construction zones. I mean, there's, so enough, there's enough space in the street yeah. for the signs. So we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm a resident at the uh, King's Court Apartments. And what's happening lately is um, we have uh, sudden uh, water stoppages. You know, we, there's no water available. It doesn't last very long, but it comes unexpectedly. And then now, uh, I'm not sure I'm checking with my, um, the manager of the, the unit. There is a, uh, there was a sudden uh, sound that I had never heard before. I've been there three years. Like, you know, like when the guys are, are, are opening up a hole on the street, yeah. that, that noise, right. it came from the water heater, you know. Okay. So I don't know whether it's part of the, what they're doing out here or not. Okay. Uh, as far as water shutoffs, our contractor and, and our team should be notifying. That should not happen. They should just be surprised by a water cutoff, unless it's an accident. You know, they may, they may cut a water line and they have to go run around and try to notify everybody. But if there's a planned outage for a short period of time, you should get at least a 24 to 48 hour notice for that. So, um, and I don't know if you guys, guys have our, our uh, capital projects officer that's a representative of the city that is uh, is part of our public works team they're there for you to notify once if you have questions or comments like that or you have a, a situation you need addressed by the contractor uh, Sean Bobay and if you meet me maybe uh, on the side I can give you Sean's contact information or mine all right good evening everyone um, as mentioned I'm Mike Shannon I'm I'm the director of the city's development services department, and what that means is um, I oversee the zoning portion for the city, the building department, and code enforcement. So uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, just a few updates of, of, of what we're working on in this area. The, the biggest thing, uh, we are facilitating, kind of leading the effort with our noise ordinance task force. So uh, as you, you may or may not know, for the past year and a half, we've, had, uh, we've been asked by city council uh, to look at our current noise code because we have, and not just in this area, all over the city, we have thousands of noise complaints uh, each year and we currently address them in accordance with our current code. Uh, the council has asked us to work with a task force, a balanced task force, and I actually see several of them here today. So if, if you're on the task force or you've been attending regularly, do you mind just kind of raising your hand a little bit? I see a few of you, three, four, Five, six, okay, seven, all right. 
So a bunch of you. There's there's actually 15 members of the task force plus another couple dozen folks that, that regularly join. Uh, and we have been working and going through uh, not only the current code, trying to figure out what we should do differently, uh, if anything. We've also actually been working with uh, additional code enforcement in the evening dedicated to uh, noise uh, complaints, okay? Uh, so since October, we have some dedicated code officers. It's the first time we've done this. They work actually from 8 p.m. to uh, 4 a.m. Uh, and they've addressed over 2,500 calls since October. Uh, we have found a lot of non-compliance. We've actually found a lot of compliance. So I think part of the, part of the uh, issue will be education throughout the city of what is a noise violation and what isn't. But we actually have found um, about 15% of the calls that we get are actually in violation when we get there, okay? So 85% of the time there's no violation, about 15% of the time. We have statistics that we could bore you with. I have them all on my website. Anybody wants them, we can, we can show you all the calls. We actually have a log of all the calls uh, that, we've, uh, that we have. It's all open on our website. But the goal is to use that data and what we're finding and seeing out there in the real world, which you are all experiencing, but not just here, citywide, to figure out what we can do to help business owners and neighborhoods, as well as we get a lot of calls for neighbors having issues with their neighbors, right? The house party, maybe, maybe right? Okay. Um, so we're trying to figure out what we can do better to help those entities, all of those entities coexist. Uh, we actually just brought on, you may have seen some of our, some of our news uh, cast, uh, news members have actually reported on this, but we actually just this month brought in uh, a noise expert kind of consultant that does this, works on noise ordinance, has had some success nationally helping develop a better ordinance that really allows people to coexist a little bit better. And I think, I think Mark, you, you kind of started this with how can we coexist better uh, with some of these issues and noise being one of them. So certainly that's the biggest thing we're working on. It will likely take us through the, through the summer months uh, before we can bring something back to the mayor and council with recommendations. Uh, but we're going to continue working with uh, the members of the neighborhood, the members of the business community, and all others that are involved. So we're kind of excited about it. It's, been a, it's not an easy issue. It's not a, I think if we had a simple solution, we would have probably enacted it uh, last fall. But it's, uh, it's something we're going to continue working with until we get it right. Uh, but I have a lot of information that I can share with everybody. We, I think you guys have all the information because uh, you've been very involved. So, so that's the biggest issue I have for you. And uh, I'd be happy, I'll be around for the rest of the meeting to talk about any other issues uh, for you. Uh, so I can answer questions now or however you want to do it. Yes, sir. Well, about a few weeks ago, was a uh, reporter in the news that uh, you were working on uh, noise ordinance between construction and bars and music and all that. You were quick from passing the construction rules and all, but you didn't have to do anything about the, the music. So what's going on? I mean, you were so, I mean, to me, you know, the people complain about construction, they got, uh, you know, results straight away. We've been we, uh, complaining for 20 years. we got nothing. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, I wonder what's the hold up on that. Yeah, okay, so I, I think everybody heard the question. So yes, actually, there were, so there were actually two noise issues that we were asked to do. The, the noise, the construction noise issue that we just uh, we just got passed by city council uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, uh, I think it was last month. Uh, that actually started uh, actually three years ago. So it took us three years to do that. Certainly, there was a pause because of the pandemic. So that was about a year, 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 almost a year and a half. But it actually did take us about a year and a half of working with the construction communities and some neighborhoods to figure out what that looks like. Uh, so while it's already done, meaning that piece, it did start first and it ended first, uh, but, but that was challenging as well. I was in a lot of meetings with a lot of neighbors, maybe residential homeowners, apartments, and or uh, those who live in houses next to construction projects. Uh, that was a challenging one. But we did just pass something. I think we did make an improvement to the code. And if we have construction companies that don't follow the rules, and after we issue them a couple either warnings or citations, we will have to shut them down. That's what we ended up doing with the, with the construction companies. And our construction industry in town actually agreed with that. They, they thought that was a good that was a good way to solve that problem. But um, I know we're still working on the, the the other parts of the noise ordinance that we've been tasked to do. But again. It did start a little bit later, right? It started in early 2020. 
Uh, so hopefully we'll get it done before the end of this year. Uh, I won't promise you anything because then I might be back. You might call me a liar uh, <laughs> in a few months. But we're working our best to try to get something uh, that everybody can live with. So, but I know it's, it's, it, it takes longer than we all would like. So, but that's a good question. Thank you. I've got a question for you. I've been in this neighborhood 55 years. So I've seen the strip when it first started. The noise has gone really bad, especially, I mean, I'm used to being in, I live right up on Ash Baker. The noise has gotten really bad between the hours of one o'clock and four o'clock in the morning because of the cars. They have their boom boxes full blast. Some of the neighbors complain about vibration of their windows. That's how badly it gets. Uh, is there a study being done about that? And what can we expect? Sure. So I think all of it, oh, sorry. All of that is actually being looked at right now. I mean, we, we're getting calls. I, I think, let me, let me step back. So the city manager asked us in October to really dedicate some staff. That's all they do three nights a week on the heaviest nights of the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And we've been doing this since October. Uh, asked us to only take noise calls. So uh, we have the police chief here and you know, the police department gets a lot of different calls uh, every single day. And they're out there you know, protecting us, responding to all different types of priority calls. Uh, but what we've done since October is actually just add additional staff, six additional staff in a pilot program that really focus on what's going on, whether it's noise from somebody's business, whether it's noise in and around the business, like cars, because that is a violation of our current code, and or the house parties I described earlier, because we get a lot of calls on that. Actually, that's where most of the calls in the cities come from, is from calling on your neighbor who's partying too loud uh, in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, but we get, I said, thousands of calls, but that is part of it. So I don't know what the solution is going to be uh, and what the task force will tackle, but I think that's all built into it. And that's actually why we have code officers working the late shift, not just 8 to midnight or 8 to 2. It actually goes to 4 in the morning uh, because we want to capture some of that, that even when some of the businesses shut down uh, at 1 or 2 in the morning, there's still, we know there's still a lot of noise, okay? So that's part of our, what, we're, what we're looking at. I don't have an answer for you on what the change is going to be, uh, but I've, I think it's, it's part of what we're doing. Okay, because we have a lot of young families moving in, mm -hmm. with young children, and it's, it's different for them because they wake up and then they have to go to school the next day. This goes on until 4 in the morning. So I'm saying, do y'all have a study going on? Uh, do you plan to continue to try to come up with a solution? Yeah, so, and I'll just, I'm going to repeat the question. So she asked, uh, she made a comment that, um, uh, I'm sorry, what was your name? Carol. Carol, thank you. So Carol mentioned again that, hey, this goes on until so four in the morning. We have a lot of young families. Uh, difficult to get to sleep. Young kids got to go to school. And, and again, the question was, is there a study going on? Are we going to come up with some solutions? I said, and, and I'll just repeat. Yes, we, we're actually working. We have a pilot program that was authorized by the mayor and council. Uh, last summer, we started in October, so the study, or we call it a pilot program, we've dedicated additional staff to actually take down the calls, study the calls, bring that to the task force that I talked about, and to develop solutions that we can combat some of these issues. So all of that, whether you call it a study or a pilot program, we will bring those back to the mayor and council uh, with some recommendations, whether it be code, code changes and or policy changes uh, to help alleviate some of those issues. Yeah. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, I've seen the reports online mm -hmm. from October all the way until last month, mm -hmm. and I see where these you know calls are coming in. A lot of them are repeat offenders. What's going to be done about those repeat offenders? Uh, so the question again: what, what if we have repeat offenders? Right? We have we have a noise ordinance on, on the books right now that says you can be this loud if you're this type of property. If you get caught over that. We have, uh, right now, that the code says you'll get either a warning or a citation. In our code right now, there's no, there, there's no elevated repeat violator condition. That is a topic that actually has been discussed by the task force. There's been no resolution to that. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but I know that's one of the, one of the topics that many of the group, I think, are shaking their head, dude, right? It is one of the, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you get caught speeding once, and I'm not a cop, so I don't want to use your example, Keith. If you get caught speeding once, it don't take away your car, right? 
But if you get got speeding 25 times in a month, well, maybe the penalty should be a little higher. And I'm sure it is. Right, Chief? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble because I'm putting the Chief on the spot. OK. And I, I have one in the, it's here. Is that OK? I just wanted to declare. Well, last question? Is that right? OK. We're going to I just wanted to declare because yeah. from what you just said. Yeah. So you said there was no code for, uh, for elevated? Repeat violation. So if there is no code, how do you get a code pass? Is so it a we, thing? Is yeah. it what? So we have to do it. Yeah, so I said right now in our current noise ordinance, there's no additional uh, either penalty or escalated penalty if you get one violation or two. It's just it's the same ticket or violation. Now the idea being is you don't want to keep getting tickets. They cost money, it's a class C misdemeanor. Uh, but in order to get a code change, uh, the only people that can change our laws and change our code are the mayor and council. But the idea will be that we will make recommendations, the task force, and then likely me as the building and code official will make a recommendation to our council colleagues, uh, our council members, uh, on whether or not we want to change the code or not. And again, that and may or may not be added to the code. And so as residents, can we write our letters? Can we write our letters? Oh, absolutely, our, yes. Oh, absolutely. Can we write our congressmen or our, our city officials? Because I'm ready to go to the top. I just moved here. I've only been here since. May. Sure. I mean, well, I, I, I'd love for you to, to, to write us and the task force that's working on it, but you're always welcome to certainly write your elected officials. I, uh, I, I don't want to speak to that, but I, the, the city council members will be the ones voting on a city code change. Good evening. Hello. Uh, how many people were not here last week? Okay, not too many. So, before I ended the meeting, or we ended, or our partner ended the meeting last week, I mentioned that I wanted everybody to understand, I wanted everybody to, to know that we will continue to work on this thing. And last week's, or last meeting wasn't just a conversation, and we forget about it until the next time. I wanted everyone to know we're working on it, and uh, doing our best to come up with a solution that's sustainable, that works, and is sustainable. So, uh, I've, I've, put together three options. They're, they're, they're parking related. And the first two are probably not sustainable from a financial perspective, but I'm gonna put them up here anyway. Now, if you get mad when you see these things, the guy who, the guy who put this together is standing back there. I'm just presenting it. Deputy Chief Chris Benavidez uh, is back there. Raise your hand, Chris. That's the guy to throw the darts at. Um, no, seriously, uh, Chris uh, was the captain assigned to the emergency, emergency management um, center, the EOC, EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, um, on the, that's next to the uh, call center, and he worked there for a number of years, and. He's a big project guy, and he put this together for me. And I asked him to, to take a look at it and map it all out. He's been the uh, the uh, ops coordinator for uh, the incident commander for the Final Four and a lot of big events here in the city. So he knows how to put this stuff together. Uh, we've got our safe officers back there. Raise your hand, guys. We've got them back here as well, and everybody who's familiar with the city. And I, I just want to comment real quick before I do this. This only take a minute, but I just want to comment on, on some of the uh, Carol, your, your concerns about the noise, and man, your concerns about the noise. In, in my humble opinion, I'm not sure what we're studying. The noise is coming from the strip as they come back in the neighborhoods. There's your study. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm not sure, again, it, it's, it's, it's the two worlds of the commercial community and the world of the community, uh, so the residential community are, are colliding here. And that's what we're trying to fix that. I don't know what the study is going to be, but anyway, that's my study. Um, so these are all the issues we talked about. These, you know, yes, uh, last week, last meeting, I mentioned that there's two issues that everybody's concerned about, and I wanted to make sure I was identifying them properly. One is order maintenance issues, which you see up here, and then to compound that, you have some violent stuff going on on the strip every now and then, and it's just, to, uh, you know, we just exacerbate each other. So. Um, 
that's the issues that we're looking at right now primarily. And uh, let's, can we pop up the first, uh, okay, so this, is, this first study is 25 officers and two supervisors. And what we're doing here is, is all around the, the community on both sides of the strip, we're gonna block anybody from coming in. So you can't, you can't, you don't have access to park back in the neighborhoods with this plan. It calls for 25 officers a night. I don't think from a, from a financial perspective that's sustainable, unless the bar owners want to pay for it. But, so, sorry, I know there's bar owners in here, I'm just kidding. So the second one is 15 officers. And, we, and, and we're just blocking um, both sides of the strip. I'm going back to the neighborhoods, but that, that leaves the whole backside of each, well, of the, of the, that side of the strip open. So I don't know that that's all that effective. And then the third one is probably sustainable. We got seven officers, one supervisor, but where you see the X's, they're all barricades. And, and that would effectively keep people out of the neighborhood. Now, will it be an inconvenience? to the residents who want to get in and out? Not really, because you can just get out and move the barricades if you want. Nobody's going to holler at you if you do that. But that, to me, is the most sustainable from a, from a, from a resource uh, perspective. Um, we can try that and see how it works. Um, there, there's also the options of we could give out two yellow cards or a yellow card for people who live there and they want to come back and forth. They can have that to show the officer if they get stopped from moving the barricade. But that, that's about as best I could come up with right now. Or, and, and again, anybody want to yell at Chris for these? Okay. So that's, that's about as best we can come up with right now. But, I, but, but the issue here is people going from the strip into the neighborhoods after the bars close and after the food truck shut down. If we do this, it'll probably impact that to some degree. Uh, I need a little bit more detail as far as times. And um, if people do, uh, patrons move the barricades, what are the repercussions for that? They, they would receive a ticket for that, receive a citation for that. And, and the time, I mean, this is all just big picture stuff. The, the, the details of the times, I mean, that's easy stuff to work out. But this is just the ideas that we came up with, and I just wanted to present them here to you tonight for you to consider. Yes, sir. How are you going to catch these guys from moving the barricades? We'll be patrol. We still have patrols in the neighborhoods. How are you going to physically, you know, are you going to have guys targeting, looking at, oh, okay, that guy in the suit right there moving the barricades? We have to observe it happening to, to catch them. So it's, you have to have observable. Uh, yes. Yeah, we have to observe so it. Basically, you're and, this. And again, this this is not airtight, but if it keeps the bulk of the of the uh, cars from parking in the neighborhood, maybe get some relief. The question was: Is there going to be a parking garage being built somewhere in the neighborhood, or somewhere where people are going to be able to park? No. Um, was that? You understand the problem that's created by this? I, you know, I, 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 the, 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 I'll, I'll, there's one problem I'm worried about, and it's the neighborhood, it's the re residents who live there, not where people are going to park. That's not my, that's not my concern. Okay, we'll, we'll be here next week looking at the other problem. Yeah, possibly, but again, my, my concern, is, are you a barber, by the way? No. Okay. My concern is with the residents, that's all. Well, they wouldn't be able to get tickets. They, they really wouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah, but I'll give the numbers by the numbers that they pull out. They can stay with their American. Well, I mean, that, that, that puts them in a precarious situation if somebody wants to get up in their face. I mean, it's probably not safe for them to do that. Like, I mean, I remember about this. Uh, sorry, question. We used to have that. We used to have a, uh, I don't know, some traffic on the ball there. They came around trying to visit a security officer saying, I'm here with some very big numbers. I just don't think it's safe, especially in today's world with everybody's got a gun. Can you make a requirement that you have to have a 
requirement for like a special tag that you must have under vehicle for street parking? Well, that, then we get into kind of the parking, uh, the uh, controlled parking, residential parking thing. I'm not, this is just bare bones right here. And, and it's doable, but you know, it, it, all we can do is see if it works. If it's a complete failure, we got too many people slipping in and slipping out, and nobody's getting any relief from the noise, and it didn't work. Could the city have you We, we've talked about we've talked about all types of permeations and mutations of how the parking might look and how the traffic flow might be, but we haven't come up with anything permanent yet. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Pete Dawson is going to say about this. Chief, would um, the residents have a, uh, a like a sticker that you could put on the cars, and then if the uh, uh, if a car is located in that area that doesn't have a sticker, the, the police could have it towed or or ticket that car, uh, so the residents could go to the city and prove their the residency in that area, area, and we could put a sticker on our car windshield. And so, if a car is in that area uh, during those uh, off area uh, time periods. That like you could, uh, an officer could have that car towed or, or contract with the towing company to go in and tow those cars. And, and what you're talking about is a residential parking yes. program. But yes. we talked about that, and I don't know if we've come that well. We simply haven't come to any decision on whether that's going to fly or not. I mean, you, you, you towed 20 cars and the word's out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we've done that. I live in North St. Mary's, uh, and when we towed uh, at the small apartment complex, five cars got towed and no more parking at our complex. Well, that's not working in these neighborhoods. I understand. We, we ticket and tow. We've got numbers to show. We ticket and tow all the time. Problem is, it's not having any impact because people are still parking there. Yes. Joe? My question to you was, there's a program in King Regulus that's working successfully. And I know it's uh, some of the residents there had similar problems with the business community and uh, they were able to resolve it. But I don't know exactly how they set it up. Where, where was that? The King William area. Oh. You know, the yeah. lockup. Yeah. Um, right. What's that? Hi, Carol. I'm Monty Bravo. I'm your city council member here in District 1. And uh, that is what our next agenda item is going to be for. It's the, the study by Pape Dawson, looking at a parking study in this area, looking at um, what streets are narrow enough that you could have no parking whatsoever on it if you want to, what, stair what, what uh, streets are wider, and where you would have an option of doing residential only parking during certain hours, maybe during the evening hours. And so I don't know if it maybe makes sense to move on to that agenda item right now. Let me do a few more inter go, go for it. Sure. Let me well, let me do a few more introductions just uh, real quick, uh, just like some housekeeping. Uh, we also have State Representative Diego Bernal here, and uh, I saw that uh, Senator Jose Menendez is Constituent Services Director Ana Alicia Romero is in the back, um, and uh, so I just wanted to. Yeah, I uh, with Bethany also with uh, Diego Bernal's office. Um, so I just wanted to share, uh, you know, who else was here in the room if you have other questions. Um, but just so, for those of you who were not here at the meeting last week, uh, what I heard as a number one ask was, uh, we want to be able to have limited parking in the neighborhood. That's something that we've had a conversation with when we had a town hall with a lot of the bar owners uh, for the North St. Mary Strip area, and, uh, and and they were okay with it. And so that's the direction that we, we have, the District 1 Council Office has moved in, and the city has a contract with Pate Dawson to come in and study, uh, do a parking study. We've already met with them and gave them some, some feedback on it, but this is your opportunity to give them an 
input on it so that they can get started on that. Good evening, everybody. I'm Justin Clark with Tate Dawson. So I'll be uh, uh, working with the city on this parking study. So as Mario mentioned, we've met a couple of times with city staff and, and the different various groups to talk about this parking study. So a lot of y'all's questions tonight about, about the parking, the parking permit stuff or things that we're going to be looking at. But just give you a brief, brief overview of where we're at today, what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks and months. Uh, to come on this parking study so we can come back and provide a formal recommendation on how to move forward with the situation and hopefully improve everybody's quality of life in the neighborhood. So um, up here on the on the screen is an exhibit of this area. Uh, the, the red outline is, is our study boundaries. So we'll be looking throughout this area um, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even er and other times during the week. Uh, we'll be focusing on that nighttime period, uh, really taking a look at when the bars are the busiest and causing the most uh, grief for y'all as residents. So uh, the study area just on the north, it, it's uh, Weesatch on the north, McCullough on the west, down to Myrtle Street on the south, and then 281 is on the far east side. So we'll be going through each of these streets and looking at uh, and trying to quantify what the parking issue is. How far are people parking away from the bars? How far are they willing to walk? You know, because when we set up or look at putting a residential parking permit program together for this area, we need to know a, a, a few different things. What streets do we actually need to implement this on? How far, how many blocks away from the bar area do we need to, to, to look at that? Um, you know, what streets need to be potentially converted to, to not have one parking on one side or the other to make sure it's safe for fire emergency if there ever was an event at y'all's houses. So we'll be going through that, looking at that during the daytime, taking over the next two weeks. Uh, will be very intensive effort on data collection, looking at this area and, and watching uh, during the evening. Uh, we talked about the time frames of that. Um, we will be here until 3 a.m. in the morning looking at the problem. Uh, our understanding and talking with city staff and, and the council's office is this problem. You know, after the bars close at 2 a.m., people go to food trucks and that type of thing, and that creates a lot of noise issues and people trying to get back to their cars. Um, so as far as the options, uh, there's a multitude of different things that we have talked about looking at in this area. So the residential parking permit is one of them. Uh, I heard several of y'all mention the King William study. So that ordinance is for commuter traffic right now. So it's for eight to five commuter traffic uh, was really related to the HEB staff coming in and parking on city streets. So our uh, objective with our study is to figure out how, how often, what times of day do we need to implement this? Is it uh, just certain nights of the week? Is it seven days a week, 365? You know, is it uh, just a nighttime type of thing? So that's what we have to uh, get, get all of the data uh, pulled together. Uh, we'll also be looking at alternative parking solutions. If, you, if we implement a no parking permit uh, program where each of y'all were to get two stickers for your cars at your houses, you know, what happens if you have a party at your house? How do you have people park on your street? What happens uh, with all the parking that is there? You know, if it's 500 cars, where do these cars go? How does that affect y'all's uh, operation in this area? Because we all know that they're going somewhere. They're still going to come to the bars. So we'll be looking at alternative parking facilities. Is there a way that we can incorporate parking and work with other areas that do have available parking, like where we're standing at today? You know, they have available parking, and I know the church, and we had talked about that previously, of possibly using some of this. Because the reality is they're going to go somewhere uh, if we limit every street in the neighborhood. Uh, so we need to quantify the issue and figure out what to do with it. And so the parking permit solution is one idea. Um, you know, we've talked about um, having, you know, working with even VIA to try to have a busing service to bus people in. Can we work with the bar owners to do carpool, Uber, Lyft, those type of things, and where would people park? So um, the long story short with our study is it's going to be very intensive the next two weeks. Uh, me and my team will be out here during the weekdays and uh, nighttime, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, looking at the issue and quantifying that. 
uh, our goal and, and our, uh, with our study is to come back and work with the city staff and come back to this group, present our findings as far as what we saw data collection wise. I'll be showing pictures, you know, making sure everyone is comfortable with what we saw and then our recommendations moving forward. After that point, um, you know, if it's a residential parking permit, there would need to be signs put up. We would have to work on the permits for that work on the ordinance with the city so it's it's a process to get this done so uh, again the goal of this is to come back to y'all in may and kind of present the results of our study and uh go from there yeah i know you're doing a study once you go get go to the police department and pull all those files and records of all the reports that we've done in the streets you know the all these all these reports about drunks double parking blocking our driveways, that will help your study. You don't have to go too far to do a gigantic study. That alone will tell you how bad the situation is in this neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, I know that you said that, you know, talking about the parking situations and all that. The parking is not going to stop unless we put up those signs. Because these kids don't care a damn about the neighborhood. They don't care about how we live. I mean, I've had People steal from our yard, people urinate in my yard, people take dumps in our yard, people, you know, just do unrealistic things in our neighborhood. These studies that you're gonna do, it's not gonna help our neighborhood, because I know what's gonna happen, nothing. I've been here 47 years and nothing has been done. And then I told the safe officer, all this is gonna be pushed underneath the rug like everything else. And, I, and also, what I'd like to see is as Pepe Dawson, I know Pepe Dawson is also a survey company. I'd like to see a survey on these bars, see how far, because there's a limit of 300 feet from a church, and they're not supposed to get a uh, permit, a liquor permit. And I guarantee you there's some bars around here that are less than 300 yards. That's true. Uh, how are you guys doing? I'm Mark. It's I own Brass Monkey. I'm going to address the question you had about the, the church and schools for the church it's the church's front door to your front door that has to be 300 feet that isn't cutting across the street that's going down the sidewalk to the corner going across etc that eats up all that square footage so it wouldn't release a liquor license if you didn't comply into that so the ones that are currently open comply just I'm here today because I saw this on the news and um, you're talking about the, the bar owners comply. My son was the victim of a violent assault at Paper Tiger and lost his eye. Okay, and they allowed minors in there. Uh, I had to, my, uh, the, the people at Paper Tiger did not call the police. Uh, they didn't call the ambulance, my son's friend did. And when they, they took him in, I called and made the report um, about what had happened, and it was upgraded to a felony assault. Detective Bottolari told me not to um, call the media because uh, that could hinder the investigation. And so I didn't. When I saw this on the news, I thought it was important that I come and tell y'all that they should not be letting minors in there. I called and left messages for Chad Carey numerous times. Yeah, I know who you are. Numerous times, let my phone number ask for video footage of anybody saw who assaulted my son. Nobody called me. Nobody helped us at all. My son lost his eye in your club. And when I had to call TAPC myself because nobody reported it. So I wonder how many times do people get thrown out of the bar and no reports are made and he's allowed to do business with impunity while my son is disfigured Okay, so it took a lot of courage for me to come here to say this to you, but you know, there's real people behind the violence and the alcoholism and everything that occurs here. And I just want to make sure everybody hears me. It's, it's horrible that that happened, and I feel really bad. And one of the things that happens is when there's things like that in a bar, we as bar owners, club owners, are required to contact TABC. We don't need to wait for SAPD to do it. We are required to do it on our own. If we don't do that, that's a violation of TABC. 
That's something that they can look into. But when we have big issues, not just a little scuffle, that's a huge issue. We have to contact that. You know, I don't understand why you're sitting here standing there acting like you care. You know how many people I've seen walk out of your bar? Mm -hmm. Dead ass drunk falling on their face down our street? And you're talking this bullshit right now? Don't be acting like you care because you know you don't. I wouldn't be here if I didn't care. I understand you're upset. And nothing's perfect start, in the bar world. When you start filming everything? People do film them. Are you over-serving them? We're not over-serving. Don't give me that crap. You know you are. We're not over-serving. You know you are. I'm there's a, okay, there's I'm a pamphlet. I, 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 you're more than welcome to do We have over 30 cameras in our building. I watch those. What we have a company kid? from Vegas. What about that kid that passed out of Joe's front yard? He came from your bar. He even we, said he was there. We, he was we contacted. He was underage. Right. We don't allow minors in. We've never let minors in. We get it roughly about. That's right. You don't let minors in. You let the dollar in. No. We don't charge cover. We have security at the front door. That's how stupid you are. You don't understand what I just said. All right. That's fine. We can disagree to disagree. But the point is, we get a lot of minors that come to our door. We do not let them in. We get five, six fake IDs per night that we turn away. We used to keep them to prevent them from going to other bars. We were told by SCPD, we're not allowed to keep those IDs because it's not, it's their property, we can't keep them. So we have to give them right back, and then they go down the street That's to right. someone else. That's right, you can't keep their ID. You can keep right. a liquor from them, but you don't. Uh, if I had a bakery and I was open at night and we had these issues, I understand your concern, but I have a right to run a business. The city yeah, dictates. You also have a right to supply them to parking. You shouldn't even be open. Because I don't have parking? You have the right to supply parking for them too. Right. And you don't. So why are you open? We're grandfathered in. Because you care. We're grandfathered in, well, like a lot of places, like the places downtown that have zero parking. You can't park anywhere. Well, they have no parking, parking lot. What little parking you have, you, it's for your employees. We have you parking there. You don't even park there. You park across the street. All right, all right. All right. Let's, let's, let, I, I'm going to this. Sorry. Sorry. I combined your name. I'm your first and last name. Um, all right, we're going to save time for the all the bar and club owners to come up here and uh, present the St. Mary, North St. Mary's Business Association's agreement. And let's save that time and let's try and cool our jets. Gilbert. <laughs> um, Mark's a big boy, he can handle it. He, he's, he's always willing to talk. Um, all right, so this is supposed to be about finding balance, all right? Um, it's, it's between, the balance is between the residents and the bar and club owners, all right? And we're worried about, you know, the maintenance issues um, that are, then the violence exacerbates all that stuff. You know, we don't like to come out of our homes and there's beer bottles in our yards, there's vomit, you know. I mean, okay, so I've had somebody throw up on our front porch because they're just sitting on our couch that's on the front porch. I've had somebody take go number two in the yard, you know, had people just go all the way to a, basically our backyard to go urinate. Had people having, you know, throwing out the condoms after having sex. Like, there's a lot of these maintenance issues, and if we can take care of the maintenance issues, it 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 will, you know, improve the quality of life for residents so much, and it, it can create, you know, some coexistence here. Um, now, something I put together here is uh, a timeline of what's going on here. And the goal is to get to 2024. I know we want immediate action, and there are some immediate action items, but things are going to take time to change. And the businesses agree that things are going are gonna to change when a lot of these things get done. Um, we've, got, we've got Don Pitts and uh, helping um, Mitigate sound. Uh, he he started uh, March first, I believe he was hired. Um, so he's going to go into every you know bar and club that's having noise problems and go in there and try and figure out how to make it work with the the bar and club and residents and educate people. 
Um, we got the Saint, North St. Mary's Business Association Agreement. All right, uh, we've got 16 of 19 bars and clubs, I believe, have basically agreed to, to this, you know, changing some standards and having a minimum standards for operation over here to improve things for the neighborhood. Um, I know there'll be some debate here whether they'll work or not, but these other things will, these all tie together, okay? So we got the parking study, we got residential parking protection or just residential protections in general. Uh, we've got the bond complete, getting the bond completed, uh, multifamily living projects that are gonna be completed um, and uh, SAPD substation. So goal is to get to, I believe good is on the other side of 2024. It's just gonna take some patience. So this, I put this together. This is how this is gonna help balance out the neighborhood here. You know, we have all these Tobin Hill initiatives. We got the construction, we got the North St. Mary's uh, Business Association Agreement and getting residential protections. So with the bond construction um, and uh, multifamily construction, uh, and we got the SABD substation, these things are gonna improve the infrastructure of the neighborhood and it's, it's gonna, with the significant increase in multifamily living, businesses are gonna be less reliant on having cars come over here. You know, you're, gonna, you're not gonna need as much of a need for parking with that with a thousand plus new multifamily living apartment units here. Now, I know that's gonna enrage some people because that's also changing the dynamic of the neighborhood with that many multifamily living uh, uh, residences, but we're in a dense population. You know, San Antonio is growing faster than the housing, so that's just something that's we can't change. It's, we, people have to have somewhere to live. Um, and with the construction, it'll also create a safer, more functional community for residents, business, ped pedestrian, cyclists. With, the, with having that substation there, the, the road making more sense, um, and perhaps less traffic. Uh, these residential protections, uh, you know, we've got the parking study being done, uh, Don Pitts um, and uh, Mike Shannon facilitating the noise ordinance task force and improving people's quality of life. Um, uh, those improved parking protections for residents will reduce those maintenance issues and strengthen the North St. Mary's Business Association Agreement. Um, so this agreement here is the most immediate action we have. Um, and uh, to tie into the parking study, also what Chief McManus proposed with the uh, barricades. Um, those things uh, are something that, you know, we have going on right now and we got to remember that a lot of this is tied to this construction getting, getting done, that a lot of this is going to improve the neighborhood. And I've talked with this barn club owners, business owners, and they agree. They see the future. They see, they see 2024 and they see how the neighborhood is going to change. And they're gonna, they're you know, they're gonna change with the neighborhood. You can't, you, you have to go where, you know, the cli the clientele is. So they're gonna change with the neighborhood, and that's not a bad thing, you know. When you, I'll I'll, I'll go further here and how it, it benefits the businesses. Um, talk about the res. Some of this we saw at the last meeting. You know, we talked about the residential parking program. You know, protecting the residents you know, and, and lessening the impact of what's in front of their houses happening is going, is, is the greatest, is gonna be the greatest improvement for, for the residents. Um, additional measures, you know, they're restricting the access to some residential, residential streets. It's, some, some streets are so inundated with bar traffic, it's, it's dangerous to just sit outside and, you know, you can't go out with your kids. I mean, it's, uh, it's not that like that they're violent. It's just the traffic is just insane, you know. So uh, some of those, some places might just need to have traffic completely restricted down the streets um, for improvement. Um, the theory I have, I'm sure that I'll get some. Yes, I don't know if he would subscribe to this, but I think that if you reduce the guns, you're going to reduce, I mean, reduce the cars, you're going to reduce the guns. 
There's nowhere for them to keep it. You can't bring it into the club. You're not going to bring it. If, you know, you're not. What are you going to stash it if you take an Uber? Um, and reducing the drunk driving. You know, we got. We've got it. The future is ride sharing. So it's you just. We're just investing where the future is going. Anyways, um, the ride share program. Um, you know, getting the bars and clubs to help run that or something. Um, there's a lot of benefits right share programs for businesses. Um, there's apps now that you can incentivize your customers to come and uh, they can earn rewards. And it's essentially, you know, you pay for their Uber as long as they pay for their tab of a certain dollar amount or something. You know? So there's, there's, uh, there's studies been done on that to, that has actually increases revenue for bars on, through this uh, free bird app. Um, noise compliance and mitigation. Y'all got to turn the music down. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> there are, there are, spot, there are just, there are just spots. It's not every, every place. It, you know, there are just spots where it's just like, you're just way too close to a resident. It's not, you know, it's not feasible to have it above a certain level. Even if you're compliant, say you're at 63 dB at night, which is the level right now. Some places are so close that 63 dB is incredibly loud still. No outside DJs. Yeah. 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 My yeah. clubs are typically indoors, and we, have, we do have a lot of DJing outdoors. So we've had a pandemic also um, uh, that, but you know, music, this, you're going to argue with science with me on this one. So let's not argue with science. Volume of, sa of sound is scientifically linked to increase some, so consumption and aggression, okay? You know, you, you, get them, you get them liquored up and you get them the loud music going, bad things are gonna happen. You know, just, you gotta have those kind of considerations. Uh, drink prices. Um, I mean, alcohol is the root of all the problems on the street. There's, it, it's where, it's, if, without that alcohol, People don't get in fights. I've, I've, I used to party in college a lot, like you know Thursday through Sunday. Like I was terrible. Um, had to drop out. Um, <laughs> I did graduate eventually, um, uh, and then. Uh, but every fight I've ever been in was with another drunk person. So, and I'm considered a calm person and calm demeanor. So, um, we got. Uh, you have to have your price reflect the volatility and instability it unleashes on the neighborhood, the city, and pa patrons' lives. You know, it's the, they're pouring it down their throat. They're getting in car crashes. They're getting, they're the ones getting shot and killed, okay? They're the ones in the fights. Um, and uh, if you look into the research, I'm not gonna share all the research, but you know, St. Patty's Day, Ireland, guess what? They have drink minimums. That, 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 is, that is law there that you have drink minimums because it's such a problem. When they did the research, the drink minimums priced out the binge drinkers. It didn't price out the person that's out to try and to go out and be social and have a good time. It, it priced out the people that go there and they're like, oh, you know, $1 whiskey. I'm going to drink this all night. And so we got to keep that in mind. Like, it, effect, it affects a smaller portion. And when it comes to drink prices, you reduce whatever revenue you reduce it to, to improve safety of the neighborhood and the safety of your patrons and employees, that's the, just the tax you have to pay. All right? That's, that's the tax you pay. Because if you don't, the tax that gets paid is people's lives, people's health, people's mental health. I mean, I've been sick for six months because of all this stuff. Like, I just, I, my mental health is not not well with this. I, I have to compartmentalize it. Um, food truck operations can't keep the food trucks open all night. It just keeps them keeps people on the streets for too long. They don't live here. They don't need to be here. They don't need to be in our front lawn. They don't need to be. And and a big part of that is. The, they drag the trash down there, and then you know there's nobody there to pick it up because everybody's left. All the 
every employee of the strip is gone. The, the people are still hanging out though. Um, and being too close to the residents. I mean, you know, this. I think this thing, something we can, we could fix. You know, there's there's places on the strip that can not be right in somebody's front yard. allowed to stay open after the bars and clubs have closed. Um, they're a tenant and there is no code of ordinance that says that they can't operate after the closure of the, the business of their tenant. What I'm saying is the person that owns the restaurant or the bar Yes, that's what we're hoping with the North St. Mary's Business Association agreement is that they agree we need to close these, these trucks earlier. So that's something they can do for the neighborhood in good yes. faith. They want, they want to stay in their neighborhood, then they should help us. Yes. We're the ones that pay the taxes. And it's a nice neighborhood that's coming down here to open the business. But they can go somewhere else if they don't want to comply with us. Yeah, we're the most food truck friendly neighborhood in San Antonio. I don't, does anybody else know a more food truck friendly neighborhood? Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, so the street trash. I mean, just get it cleaned up. I mean, it, it, you, you know, you, you, you wouldn't leave a bag of trash out in your front yard. Don't leave it in front of your business. I know it's hard with the construction and stuff. And a lot of the trash isn't your own trash, but it's patrons' trash that they brought to our streets because um, they're drinking in the car or something. So you got to carry that. You got to carry it down impacted streets. You can't just do you know your street sidewalk. You got to do. There's enough businesses over here. You guys can cover a radius in a very, I mean, half an hour probably, and get it cleaned up. And what I say is, the street should be cleaned like your 17-year-old who doesn't want his parents to know. That they had a party while they were out of town. You know, we wake up, we have no, we don't know, you know, what mom don't know, won't hurt. <laughs> um, all right, uh, SAPD strategies. Um, allow the hire of off duty SAPD. Um, I know that this might be a problem with the union. Um, but bars are willing to pay for off-duty SAPD to be security. Um, uh, crowd control, you know, it's it's a crowd control issue over here. It's it, you're talking about five to ten thousand people frequenting the strip. You know how how can you police that? There's not going to ever be enough police. Like that's one thing I'll say is like we can keep chiming, chirping about we need more SAPD. What, what are they going to do? You know, to control this much activity, you're gonna need, you need like a thousand officers to catch everybody. Not everybody's gonna get caught. It's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be like, you just have to control the situation, but, and it's, it's just not gonna be cost effective. Um, uh, I think all these solutions um, presented today will, will make patrolling more St. Mary's Strip. You know, safer, easier, and more cost effective. All right. He's been raising his hand for a while. So. Thank you. I got you. Here. Oh, one thing I'll say is that the bar and club owners, I've talked with, what, I think 16 and 19. Three I haven't talked with, they just don't make themselves available. But they agree with these solutions. These are not strip killing measures. These are strip thriving measures. They're gonna, they, 
if, if your intention is to kill the strip, this ain't gonna do it. This is gonna this is gonna help the strip. It's gonna, but that's a good thing. You make the strip better. You make the neighborhood better. You make it better. You make it safer. Oh, thank you. Uh, I live, <coughs> excuse me, on mistletoe. I uh, bought my house for thirty-six thousand dollars in two thousand and six. I play in the San Antonio Symphony. I don't have a job. I don't have insurance. Just if anybody wants to support us, I'd appreciate it. But um, here's the thing. I'm spending $7,000 a year in taxes. There's a house across the street from me. It's about to sell for $600,000. So I'm sure the city is going to get us even more. Um, these people living here should not have to pay the outrageous taxes. I should be able to walk out my street and invite my friends and park in front of my house on mistletoe. You guys are looking at it from like, you know, the bars, but these restaurants that are unbelievable that I, I go to, um, you can't park on my street. And all of my neighbors complain about it. All of my neighbors have to have uh, cars towed because they're parked in their driveway. Um, for seven grand, it's a lot of money for me, especially since I don't have a job. And um, for people that are even smaller streets, I don't think that they should be penalized by the city with these horrific tax increases. So has anyone thought about having um, an area like this where we can have, you know, when you hit 65, your taxes get freeze. Um, all those, also the people around here, because we're being penalized financially because this place is great. And I'm sure you guys know, there's gonna be a thousand more people in about two years that are gonna be living in all these incredible apartments that are gonna be spending $2,000 for, for maybe 800 square feet. A thousand, right? And I guess where they're gonna to wanna to go on Friday. So, um, I don't think I should be spending $7,000 and I can't park in front of a house. People can't even park in front of their house. So why are we being taxed? Maybe during this time, maybe you can say, hey, you know what, everyone's living here, you're gonna have a huge tax decrease. And so you can figure it out, and then you can charge whatever you want for taxes, but we're being, we're being hurt. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, we're back. Where you can't solve here tonight, but I, I agree. I, I don't want to keep paying all these taxes. Um. So, I think all that we've discussed tonight is a step in the right direction. The problem is it's a band aid on a wound that is hemorrhaging now. And my concern is that I, I was told that there's 17 bars down here. Is that true? 19. 19 bars. Okay, so, and this might go back to Mike Shannon. Um, is there any kind of public uh, notification when, because these C2s and zonings that a bar can operate in are peppered all through our inner city neighborhoods. So, is there any kind of public notice that goes out so that, uh, because this is a nightmare scenario that these people are living in, it's awful. I don't want to see this ever be repeated in another neighborhood, and I think that they should have never given CFOs to this many bars in a concentrated area, especially in a residential area. So I, I want to uh, cross your heart, hope to die, stick a needle in your eye, pinky swear promise from DSD uh, that they will never, ever let this happen again. Here, here. Uh, one thing I want to do is I want to call all the bar and club owners to the front because I think, you know, it will help to hear them talk and maybe talk about the future that they see, you know, what do they see for the trip, what do they see for their business. Parker, I, I appreciate it, just a second. I, I wanted to bring Justin back to the conversation real briefly because it seems like there's a disagreement between the neighborhood a possible solution and Chief McManus not thinking that it's enforceable. So I wanted to get into the nuts and bolts. Do we not have enough tow trucks in the city of San Antonio? Is there an ordinance that's lacking that could allow it to be enforced? But why the the disconnect, I guess. I'll just say something quick about the ordinance. So the King William one, that uh, it would be a similar parking permit situation, that's actually enforced by city staff. 
Uh, so city has a, a, an agency or a group that enforces that parking permit process. Uh, one issue that we've talked about a little bit is that they get off at five when y'all have the problem, and that's why there's a residential commuter traffic permit process right now. The issue is, is you know, dealing with that enforcement because you know we know if we propose one, there's still going to be people who try it. So how do you enforce that? So uh, that's one of the things that we'll be working through. Um, right now, the city just doesn't have the staff on as far as the city forces to enforce it in these late hours, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning when some of these issues are occurring. So it is one of the things that we'll look 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 at uh, as far as the number of tow, tow trucks. I do not know. So. There are, um, I don't know how many record companies in the, in the city, but there's a lot of them. I don't, we, I think we, I think we have four tow trucks up here on stage uh, on the nights that we have the, uh, the uh, overtime detail up here and we're constantly towing. And I don't know how many, to, I don't know how many more tow trucks we need to get up here. We're, we're not going to tow every single car right here. We don't have the capacity to do that. Uh, we're doing about as much as we can with what we have. And I wanna, I wanna say this, I'm glad I got the mic. So, I was talking to Deputy Chief Benavides and I, and about when we try option three up here. I don't wanna do it this weekend because, well, first of all, what do you think about option three? Would you like to see us try it? Mm -hmm. Is that you right there, Randy? Hey, Randy, I know, but. So um, we will try, I don't want to do it this weekend because then everybody will be mad because we didn't get the word out to everybody. So we'll do it next week. So next weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we can try it and we'll see how it works. But it, I'm gonna need Parker, you, and, and all y'all to spread the word around that we're gonna be doing it. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be getting hammered for doing it and not everybody knows about it. So next weekend, expect it. Parker's going to hand it over to the bar owners to address you, but I just want to make sure before we end the night, I wanted to make sure that we could maybe put Justin from Pig Dawson, uh, put his email up on the screen there so everyone can see it, so people can send him input on the parking study that they're going to be begin working on, and hopefully before the end of the night, you know, after some interaction with the bar owners, hopefully you all will be able to give him some uh, some input as well. Thank you. Yeah, quickly, I wanted to say, Chief McManus, you know, I really appreciate you coming up with those three options. Honestly, I was surprised that you had it so quickly. Uh, so I do appreciate that. I agree with the, the option three. In my mind, I was thinking six officers, one, like two pair, you know, uh, each kind of intersection that's kind of busy. And I think that would bring down a lot of just show of force. When we have our uniform third-party officers, they're renegades, and that's how these young kids see them, and they provoke them, and they don't have any respect for them. And it prevents problems, but it creates another side of problems, because it's, now they want to challenge it. You know, when we have security inside or outside, we do not engage. If someone's in our face, don't engage. Just if they're off the property, walk away. It's not worth it, you know? Just talk them down if you can and whatever. So police presence, I think, would solve a lot of this for residential and business owners, but it's not gonna fix everything. So we need to focus on the things that we can fix, the things that we're willing to work together on to make it better for not only the neighborhood, but the businesses as well. I don't like the fact that nightclubs have a shady past or a shady kind of impression. I started as a DJ and I'm all about the music and I wanted to run a business that if my parents were alive today, they'd be proud of walking in. And I wanted to change the way nightclubs were perceived here in, in San Antonio, you know. Um, and 21 years of doing it, owning a club, uh, I made some impact, but not a lot. 
Uh, you're just getting people that are used to the bar business and they come in and think it's a party. It's not a party. We provide the party. We need to be A, sober. Our bartenders cannot drink with the customers. That's one big thing that prevents a lot of things. We get new bartenders and we have to let them know the rules. And some of them just, uh, this isn't for me, I'm out of here because they want to party. Well, you can't party, you're bringing the party. Someone has to be in control, someone has to be sober, someone has to be responsible, and someone has to answer to police or neighbors or anybody that comes up and has these concerns. You know, you have to run it professionally. It's a business, it's not a playground, it's a club, it's not a clubhouse. You know, so we run it as tight as we can. Even we have all these rules, Things still happen. You know, you're talking about how that guy passed out on your front yard. You know, I had TBC contact us. We gave them our receipts. We gave them what they asked for so they can investigate. We don't allow minors in. I guarantee I'm not stupid. I know probably minors do come in because they have fake IDs. We train our door staff. They're TABC certified. We train them on our own way, on YouTube videos or whatever, to identify fake IDs. As far as I know, there's no class that shows you how to identify a fake ID. We just got lucky that our door guy is pretty proud of catching a man, I caught six today. And it's like, and unfortunately we can't keep them and that sucks because they're going to the next place and using them there. We're allowing them to use that fake identification to go do it to everyone else. If we could keep them, that stops them at least for the night. And it could make a, a little bit more impact of underage drinking. Um, these kids are fearless. They don't care. They're here to have a good time and they're gonna party crazy. We get military, we get college. Military gets a little, I'm prior military, I was, you know. Uh, first lieutenant in the Air Force, um, you know, I had my party days uh, and I know they can get wild and we have to identify, we have to train our staff and say, hey, they're getting a little bit out of hand, go talk to them. It's all how you approach it. There's a lot of things as bar owners and restaurant owners and club owners that we're doing to reduce that, but again, we're not going to get everything. And, you know, it takes a lot of courage to come up here knowing that we possibly could get attacked, which you saw, it's, it's hard. And I understand where the anger and, and distrust comes from. But if we didn't care, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be on that list trying to make these things. Technically, we're not, uh, we're not uh, controlled by what you guys think that we need to charge or whatever. It's, just capitalism. We can charge whatever we want. We can sell whatever we want. TABC has a say of how low we can go, what these little uh, sales and things that we can and cannot do. They enforce that. They're out here all the time. They are doing their job and they are checking us and we are answering to them. You know, it's just a combination of treating it a little bit more professional as an operator. Uh, being a little bit more sympathetic to the neighbors and what they're going to and on um, both sides not being so combative with each other You know if we can talk calmly We're gonna get a lot more done than if we're yelling at each other because then we're just gonna walk away and like You know what? I don't want to do anything all these things I've been doing screw it. I'm out, you know, and then it becomes now I'm gonna go and make it worse than when I was making it better because I'm not getting the action I want so let's just work together. I understand you're upset. You guys have legitimate issues, legitimate. None of these guys here are dismissing that. No one here, you know? You may feel different. You may feel that stuff that I say maybe, oh, he doesn't mean it, he's just saying whatever, or Chad or anyone up in this panel is saying anything. Truly, we have, we're busy, you know? Um, I have a, different businesses, I have different things here, Austin, New York, I got things going on, but I'm here because this needs my full attention because it's that delicate. So I'm here and uh, these guys are here too because it needs their attention. So just saying, if we could all work a little bit better and be less aggressive with each other, I think we can come to a resolution. And closing these bars, closing these clubs is not an option. 
I know you guys prefer it would just get rid of it, but that's not an option. You can't just close something because you don't like it. If they're operating within the guidelines of the law, there's no reason to close them down. They can't be closed. What they can do as owners is saying, well, you're harassing me. Now I'm gonna take litigation towards you for harassment. You know, we have rights just like you guys do. So let's just be a little bit more uh, aware of each other. Yeah, you're talking about being legit, following the rules and all that. Then how did that 20 year old get passed on from my yard, drunk, 20 years old, and he said, and I asked him, I asked permission from the police officer to talk to him, and he says, yes. And he's coherent. Yes, sir. By the time when I talked to him, I asked him, where were you drinking at? And he said, at the corner. And the only one corner is fresh lunch. Right. You, know, you said that, uh, <clears throat> that you know you follow rules and all that. If you didn't know that, I mean, if you follow rules, then someone or one of you guys did not follow the rules. Well, and, and that has to stop. I agree. That, 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 you guys need to pay more attention and be more alert with the people, your bartenders, your waitresses, people you hire, that they follow TABC rules. And he is not the only first one. I've had two or three guys. I had people knock my doors drunk as hell. Just last week, in front of Parker's house, two houses down, two more guys passed out drunk. I, I know there's stuff that goes on, not just in your neighborhood, but other people's neighborhoods. But we do have a policy and a process to enter our facility. Is it 100% watertight? No, people are gonna get in. They're gonna have a really good fake ID. We're quite aware of what we're supposed to do at the door, we do that, but it's still gonna happen. There's no way we're gonna catch 100% of those. So if he was, at Brass Monkey, well, let me, if he was drunk and he came from Brass Monkey, it's not because we don't care, we just let some minor in. Let me tell you something, Mark. Yeah. If you live where I live, what would you do if you have people steal from your porch, take a shit in your yard, pee in your yard, and have grandchildren and pay in front of your yard? What would you do? I would be the loudest voice in this room because that's my personality. <laughs> Right? Right. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Right that's now. why I'm here and I'm working with you because I hear you and I want to work it out. I want us to be cool. I want us to be like, hey, you know what, Mark is a good guy. I don't want to be the enemy. I don't want that's not how I live my life. But I have to, as my responsibility for my business, take care of that. But I'm trying to bridge the gap between you and me and let's work it out. But I'm telling you, none of these guys are letting just minors just come in there like, hey guys, just drink, you know? There are some bars in, in San Antonio that do that. There are. We're not oblivious to that, but we are not the ones that are doing that. My, my point so, is that you have patrons in there where they are so wasted, you still continue serving them drinks. That's not true. So we have what it's called a code four. We have different codes for security. Code two is uh, an argument or uh, altercation. Code four is someone that's too drunk to be in the building. Now, what happens is, because I've seen different videos on different sites and stuff like that, I'm gonna take a shot at every 19 bars. I'm gonna take 19 shots at every one at every place. So halfway through that, there's a point where that person still is, looks like they're sober but they're on the verge of getting drunk. So if they leave Chad's place and they're on the verge and they come to Brass Monkey and then they have one drink and then all of a sudden, boom, they're like, dude, he just had one drink. Actually, he had 17 drinks. We just don't know about it. We gave him number 18 and now it's an issue. So what do we do? We have no idea how they're coming in and how many drinks they had. All we can do is address their behavior as they come in to our facility and say, hey, they're stumbling, this person, there's different signs that can tell you that if someone's drunk. But if we're not getting that sign, and then it happens in here, it's like, well, shit, I don't want that. It makes me look like I don't know what I'm doing. But I'm not there holding this guy's hand through the whole night. How about a at the door? Let's, let's go through this, have Chad go through this agreement here. And then, uh, then something else. Hi guys, um, my name is Chad Carey, much like Parker, I'm the newly minted president of our North St. Mary's Business Association. Just so everybody has some context, 
the association was created by, um, well, a number of people, but it was led by Blake Tucker, who's one of the partners in the mix, and Casey Lang, who is a property owner and landlord for a number of different buildings down here. Um, it was originally done at a time where Blaine, who was pretty prescient of this, uh, realized that the strip was going to get busier and it would be good to try to bring some cohesion to all the different business owners that were on the strip, anticipating circumstances just like this. Um, as things got busier, you know, we all had the pandemic and then frankly, we, there was some good activity happening with the Toby Hill Neighborhood Association in 2017, 2018. Um, and then the pandemic happened and everything kind of sort of fell apart. Well, we have re-updated the, uh, the, the charter that we have for the organization. It's a 5016B. Um, and we're sort of like kind of starting fresh on our front as well. And when we say, you know, the North St. Mary's Business Owners Association, um, it, it's an open membership and it's open to a lot of the businesses that are on the strip. But, you know, we all know that the issue right now is not gonna be with Tycoon Flats and it's not gonna be with Sames. It's going to be with the, the places that are having the people and the volume and the late night hours. So uh, when we say the 19 bars, like it's not that anyone is excluded from that, um, but you know, we're the people that are going to be causing the, the bulk of the grief with the neighborhood and we want to be responsible and try to address that. So that's where we are right now. We're in the process of figuring out how, I mean, we're going to fund it internally for the time being, but in terms of getting our act together on that front, it's still, it's a work in progress, but we're moving forward with it. Um, I, I think that, I, it, did you guys see this at the last meeting? Okay. There was a handout. Okay. Um, I mean, this, this is what, um, and, and I, I should also do this, even though it sounds um, more political than necessary. Um, Councilman Bravo and Stacey Jones in his office, Representative Bernal, I want to thank them for kind of facilitating this conversation because it has been un unnecessarily adversarial for a little bit. Um, I think that uh, uh, I can brag on both of those people for. Um, for, for bringing us to the point where we're willing to make these concessions. Because these, these are real concessions, they cost real money, uh, and they take real energy. Um, so this is sort of what we came together as a, call it a floor, um, the things that we are willing to do. I think it's important that everybody here understand that this everything on here fairly significantly um, exceeds our legal requirements, what we're required to do. This is us demonstrating that we understand that there's a problem and we understand that we have a measure of culpability in what happens with the customers that come into our places. We take it seriously. Uh, I'll echo what Mark said. I can understand why you guys are angry and frustrated about this. Um, it's something that, is, that, that I, can, I can promise you uh, in our organization, it's something that has our attention and we're going to commit the resources to try to get some movement on it. Uh, rather than having to necessarily go through this, I think everybody's seen it. Um, I'm happy to take questions and to listen to you guys. I also think that this, this list is not meant to be, well, I'll say two things. We think that this is going to go a long way towards making progress, towards fixing the root of the problems that are happening, especially with the late night bar business. It doesn't mean that it necessarily will. No one in this room is going to know for sure if this is going to work, but we want to start, we want to try, we want to make an effort. Um, you have my commitment that if these things aren't moving the needle, so to speak, we'll come back and we'll think about other things. That's the first point. The second point is um, this is not meant to be exhaustive necessarily. There may be some ideas that we have not thought of. Uh, but this was done more or less in conjunction with, with Parker a little bit as well, getting his feedback, which I know came from you guys. Um, there may be some other things that, that you guys can think of that would help, that would help improve the neighbor quality of life. I think that um, I can speak for everybody on our side of this table. We are willing to consider any reasonable thing right now. Um, you do have a good faith negotiating partner on our front. Uh, at the end of the day, we are responsible for running businesses and we are heavily invested in this, right? Which hopefully, aside from the fact that says that we have a lot at stake, um, you know, we have a lot to lose as well. It's important for us. No one, no one in our group is you know, of the sort of club promoter bar owner level where we're running around having a good time doing shots at our bars. There are millions of dollars that we have invested into the real estate and the finish out of the properties that we own. Um, Danny Delgado has been down here for 12 years operating businesses. Uh, I opened my first place seven years ago. 
Um, we want to be here for another 10, 20, 30 years. We want to run our businesses like that. A big part of that is understanding our obligations to you guys. So rather than sort of go through all of these things and just read what everybody else can read, um, I'm happy to answer questions and listen to anything. Good. Hi. Um, so first off, let me just say that I, I'm very happy to see that at least, you know, 16 of the bar owners here have come to this agreement. Or, and when, when is this expected to be rolled out? Well, we can, I, I mean, I think that we're, the reality is that a lot of these, a number of these things are already happening. We've kind of already put those into effect. Um, the things that we have not uh, put into action at this point, the, the, op, the, the biggest thing is the off-county sheriff, uh, sheriff's department officers on site on Fridays and Saturdays, and that's being, I won't say it's being held up. There's a administrative process that Sheriff Salazar um, still needs to complete that authorizes um, those officers to be out here. But the difference between, um, you, you can hire right now, we could hire like an off-duty police officer from, a, it, it's difficult to do it with San Antonio Police Department. We could hire like a shirts uh, off-duty police officer. The problem is that they'll, they'll be there in their uniform, right? Um, if there's a problem, however, outside or inside of our facilities, they're not going to do anything. They're going to call. They're going to call the police. Um, so it's to, to to me, it's a little bit of a waste of resources. What um, what our group generally, and, and just so you know, guys, I own Paper Tiger, Rumble, uh, Little Death, and Midnight Swim, uh, and uh, Curry Boys and Pizza Party. So the. Um, when I'm, I'm talking in the capacity as my role as sort of the president of this organization, uh, also speaking for myself as a business owner. So ma make sure, assume that I don't necessarily speak for every single person on the strip if I do that. But um, you know, I think in general we're all we're all on board with this idea that the problematic time for us is between 1 a.m. and 2:15 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. That's the peak of the business. That's when our customers leave the bars. And right now, we don't think that there are enough uh, indicators that they need to go home. Uh, we are limited in what we can do in that. We cannot send our private security out into the streets, right? There's too many things that can go wrong for them. Um, and, and, and like Mark sort of mentioned, it almost exacerbates the situation sometimes. So um, we really believe that the peace officer solution is going to be a, as soon as they walk out of the club, they see that police are out there, it's time to get your car going, which is what we all want. So that, that's really the only thing we have not fully put into effect. The cleanup crew right now, so I know that like Aaron at Squeezebox, Danny at a lot of his places, us at our places, we've been doing the cleanup for a while. What we want to do through the business association is make it a little more cohesive um, so that we're all on the same page about how it's working. The idea, um, the talking with some feedback that Parker gave about having it done as early as we can. I mean, if there were a practical way for us to clean up that night, we'd do it, but there's no way at three in the morning to see the trash and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to get our crews out there as early as we can with the idea of starting as far off the strip as we're going to go and then sort of working in so that uh, the bulk of the neighborhood cleanup will be done ideally by 9 a.m. on Saturday and Sunday mornings. And, you know, the 17-year-old throwing a kegger with his mom or dad on home is a, is a good thing. We want this, we want the neighborhoods to look good when you come out with your coffee on your porch. And, and I know that you mentioned earlier there, there's obviously a problem with uh, minor drinking, minors start drinking, and when you get a fake ID, you're not allowed to keep it, but can you deface it some way, cut a corner out of it, put an F on it somehow, something? Not is there anything you can do? No. No. We, 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 and, uh, and a, a lot of this stuff, so there's, um, sometimes there's things, there's the legal aspects of what we're doing. The practical aspects is uh, all, of the, all of us are on a general text thread or we all have each other's contact information. So it will oftentimes happen, hey, so-and-so just tried to do this up here, they may be coming down to your place. It, it just happens at sort of an organic level in that way. Because again, we all, we don't want to deal with this stuff either. I mean, it's, it's, not, something, it's not something we enjoy. I'm just going to point out the obvious. The gallery's not on there. Who's going to clean up their mess? Aaron, Mark, are you guys going to clean up the gallery's mess? I Is anybody going to go, go over there to the gallery, knock on his door, and tell him about this? Because I just passed him when we were coming over here. Uh, okay, so um, 
I wish that we could conscript every single bar on the strip into our group to live by these rules. We can't. Well, um, the gallery club did not think that these um, that these terms were acceptable to how they want to operate their business, and that's all I'm going to say about it. That does not reflect what we believe is the best way for us to run our businesses. Okay, so of the 19 establishments that are what we're calling the Strip, how many actually do you feel honestly are comfortable and are willing to actually comply or try to follow that plan? 17. And, it, and it, by the way, there may be there may be certain aspects of what we have proposed that maybe someone doesn't like one or two elements of it. I believe that 17 out of 19 is the answer. And, it, and one of the things that, just so you guys know, I mean, this is kind of sausage making stuff. I mean, strategically what we want to do, because there will be more bars that are opening, there will be more clubs that are opening, the, the base zoning exists for this. Um, we hope that the strength in numbers things works when new people decide to open up a bar on the strip, that we can say, hey, this is our group, this is what we do. We can't make them do that, but it makes everybody feel better. I mean, you guys know how pricing can work sometimes. If you own a burger joint next door to another burger joint and he drops his prices, you're in business to make money. It puts some pressure on you to do that. Setting some of these floors is important because we know that, oh man, this bar down the street is doing dollar wells on Thursday night, so if we're gonna do that, then we have to compete with them. So that's hopefully, that's what we hope to, um, that's a long-term goal for this group. Well, I was gonna say, uh, I'm against the business, none of the businesses. We had businesses here before, I've been here since the 70s. I saw the strip flourish. I saw the strip die. And only because the business people weren't willing to deal with the problems at hand. The, the strip got a better publicity. People stopped coming down here. And slowly, the businesses started dying one by one and closing up. Like I said, I'm not against the businesses, but you'll have to work together as business owners and come to a uh, realization that if you don't clean up the problem, you might not be having a business here very long. People will stop. Um, I couldn't agree more. Again. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you can uh, you can listen to to all of us talk about all of our great intentions, and you can you know it can sound like we're you know flirting with everybody's best instincts. The reality is we have every we have every motivation in the world to run these businesses well. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to charge two dollars for drinks. I want to charge nine dollars for drinks. Um, I don't want to have to worry about getting a binge drinker to come into my bar. I want to get the person in the two thousand dollar a month apartment to come and spend money in my places. Um, we have lots and lots of money invested in our businesses on this trip. We want them to be successful for the long term. I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate it. Um, if, Ultimately for us, if we don't run our businesses in a place where customers feel safe, then we won't have to worry about picking up trash because no one's coming. So then, okay, I, and you know what, I thank every one of those bars for agreeing to this, but what about the gallery? We're gonna be the street that everybody's going to ignore and we're gonna have trash all because of the taco truck. What's gonna happen to Valdez now? Who's gonna pick up the trash if the gallery doesn't wanna do it? I think that the idea of the trash pickup, that when I said kind of making it more of a coordinated effort, is that we're not gonna we're not gonna worry at a business owner association level about well that's not in front of our place or whatever. We're gonna take care of the neighborhood as a whole. We're not we're not gonna worry so much about oh well, gallery didn't contribute. So it, we we can't be worried. I I can't be worried about that in my businesses. If someone doesn't pay their fair share, okay, that's I can't control that. I can control what I do. Um, a, a lot of this stuff, and I know that no one, this, this, don't, don't hear me saying not my problem when I hear this, but a lot of this stuff, guys, is going to come down to enforcement. If someone's breaking the law, they need to go to jail. If someone's doing things in your yard, they should be arrested. Um, 
as business, I can, I can promise you, we will be the first people to help you call the police if there is something bad going on. I stopped and there was a couple, some, somebody broke into their, uh, this was during the daytime, somebody broke into their house and they caught them on their way out. And, you know, I stopped and made sure that they were okay. A lot of this is gonna get back into enforcement. And if someone's breaking the law, if we are breaking the law, then we should go to jail and we should suffer the consequences. It has not been my experience My experience living in this neighborhood has not been that the police are particularly proactive. If I call with a serious complaint, something happening, they may or may not come, and they may or may not do anything about it when they do come. And I don't think that you're gonna have any kind of resolution if the police don't buy in. They have to do their job. And with all this terrible climate of defunding police and police don't know how to do their jobs or whatever, it doesn't make them want to do their jobs. And I feel like it hurts our neighborhood because, I mean, I've called police a lot of times. Right. And sometimes they just don't even come. It, it, it won't make you feel any better, but we have, we have the same problem sometimes. Uh, I, I, I don't, uh, Chief of Madison's gone. Um, I mean, I think this is, it, some of this is like, we want to help facilitate this conversation, but a lot of this does have to be um, a conversation for him. The idea behind the Bear County Sheriff's off-duty police officers is that they will patrol the streets and that they will arrest people. I made very, I made very sure to discuss that with Sheriff Salazar because the last thing we need are a bunch of guys on the streets who just call the police who take 30 minutes to show up. That doesn't do any of us any good. Um, and the knucklehead crowd who's going to cause some of these problems, they understand that. Um, the Bear County Sheriff's Department officers that we are going to hire and we are going to pay for, they are going to patrol the streets and they are going to, they will arrest people. They will act as officers, as peace officers. Um, as a, a, with respect to how that actually happens, one of the things that I've had some very preliminary conversations with Parker about is once we can get, once we can get them out um, and working, I would love for there to be a way that we can somehow coordinate with the neighborhood if there's if there's an issue that they see. I mean, what I would like is, depending on where you live, let's say that you know you live on Cortland, and I live across the street from High Tones. Okay, if you live across the street from High Tones, um, and you see somebody doing something they shouldn't do, beating each other up. Beating each other up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> If, if, you, if you see a street fight and it's spilling over into your house, rather than calling 911 and saying get out here and it takes a long time, it's conceivable because these, these officers are going to be in our employ as the Business Owners Association. Um, we can maybe figure out a way to say, hey, red alert in front of high tones and we can get those guys over there ASAP. So what is your timeline? We hope that we, we thought they would be out last weekend. We don't know if they'll be out this weekend. Officer Pete Gamboa works directly with the sheriff and he's kind of in charge of this program. Um, Sophie Coe, my partner, talked to him today. He's still waiting on the administrative part of this to get released to the county. There's a, I, I, I don't claim to know how, how that works exactly, but in order to have peace officers do, do off-duty work, there's a process that has to be followed. That's why SAPD, that's why we can't hire SAPD off-duty officers. If you see an off-duty officer, it's almost certainly that they're from Shirts or Von Army or some place like that. So why can't you hire SAPD to do it? That's what I understand. That's what good police chief was here last week. He mentioned that, that he didn't want to see Bear County or we, we have heard that um, from Chief McManus, who I, who I deeply respect. I think that he has a lot of good experience that can be brought to bear on helping us here. Um, again, just speaking for our association, we have asked for years for help via SAPD. We're just not, we can't wait any longer. And um, we, uh, Representative Bernal was very helpful in facilitating a meeting that allowed us to sort of think through how this would work. Um, so that's, we're going down that road for now. Um, guys, if there is a, a lot of this, if there were financial solutions to this, we will spend the money to do this. And it's not, this is not going to be inexpensive as it would probably won't surprise anyone. Hey, Jim. Uh, hey. Name's Luke, and uh, I've 
I'm thinking about this problem. Uh, I'm in IT, so everything, uh, I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You talk about, uh, Mark mentioned this, bar hopping. You know, we want bartenders to be responsible, swap drunks when they're drunk. And that's hard sometimes because they're going from place to place. I'm just saying it's kind of more of a brainstorm and throwing it out there. Is there, or is there a market? for a technical solution where there would be uh, some sort of uh, tracking, you know, uh, for the bars that generate this kind of volume. Maybe not every bar on the strip, but those where you already have bouncers, you already have an ID checks. Is there any sort of mechanism where you're scanning driver's licenses and you, you see tallies? Could you, could you do some, any, any sort of mechanism whereby you can blacklist people uh, more efficiently than a text thread? I don't know if that exists. If it doesn't, let me know. I love to yeah, right. Oh, okay. the code, man. I, I mean, that, it, it sounds great. Yes, it's the text and calling thing is highly inefficient. It's just us doing the best we can. And by the way, you're, you're, you guys also have to realize um, at the at the bar nightclub aspect of what we're doing, um, it's really you know 11:30 to 1:30, and in those two hours, um, it's ju it just gets real busy. Um, you know, we have different places have different capacities. Um, Paper Tigers CMO has a capacity of you know over fourteen hundred people. Uh, we don't we don't put that many people in it for, for our concerts. But if you get you know you get a thousand people in the room, it's it's difficult to keep an eye on everything. You know we do the best we can. Uh, Mark has talked about the staffing they do. Every single one of our bars has security, armed and otherwise. Um, but it, yeah, at some point I think you know you had mentioned. The, the only way that you're going to stop every single thing from happening is having, a, you know, a thousand police down here. That's just in private. I don't want this to go on all night long, and you guys have this St. Patrick's Day, and they're, and they're probably going to get busy pretty soon. So I just want just a couple of things. That one, where is this presentation available, and where is this handout? Because we had it two weeks ago. Where can the presentation be viewed and the handout be picked up from? We, I, I can share this uh, through email. We had a sign up last time. I could send out this picture. And I'll share it on Facebook for Community Association. Okay. So people can get from the sign up sheets last week and this week, they can get a copy of that. I, I, I'm just the whole presentation, I'm just asking. because Okay. That was just one. So a couple of others. Um, the uh, what, 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 bar across the street, someone asked me a question. Uh, I was probably involved in that bar across the street uh, 30 years ago. I've, I've been involved with our church since 1985. Uh, I know I don't look that old, but I am. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that, that uh, Joey, not Joey's, but the, it used to be the tortilla factory across the street. And I think what you say, it's 300 feet. It may be 298 feet. And I think what we did was as good citizens approved, you know, two feet. I mean. If we think two feet's gonna make a difference, it's not, okay? So I think we did that probably, and if someone wants to go back and look it up, go back and look it up, and I think you may see the church approving it for a two-foot variance and what they have. We can't change the whole community. Uh, the other, I'll just run through these real quick. Uh, parking, we're looking at, at creating parking lots, or spots open to the public for this lot, this lot, and across the street where we're at. So that's 60 parking spots as the church that we're looking to bring on board. Um, and we have not gotten, we're, we're, we don't know if we need to get the zoning change for that or not. And someone says, your church, you can do whatever you want to do. Well, that well, we're researching that so we can bring 60 parking spots on as, as quick as possible. And, and that probably is in the next 90 days. The other thing was on the parking, well, thank you very much. Hopefully we can fund our church and keep going. Because this is a 100-year-old church. It's 100 years old in, in, in three years. So um, the other thing uh, was brought up about the, the barricades and things like that. You know, we have the marathon program, and I, I mentioned it to the chief when he was here, and I assume someone has looked into that whole concept of what the Rock and Roll Marathon is for parking, and, you know, they are barricading, because they barricade and they have a plan, so I just mentioned that. Um, the broadcast of this is available, uh, so other people have asked me. Uh, I understand it's broadcast. This is available at nowcastsa.com that people can go see this at, and also San Antonio Public Access Channel. So I just, and I don't, maybe you put those up there as well for people. Uh, compliment to uh, Mr. Macbeth over there, Sean Bouvet and, and Sean Strong and the people of Spaw Glass that are doing this construction. They're busting their hump. They're trying to do the best they can. They've been very cooperative with what with, with we're doing with the church. Um, they did crush a, a sewer line for us and we had backups, but you know, it's okay. 
So, but, but they are doing very well and, and working the best they can. And uh, I guess the last piece is, um, let me see, I had the marathon broadcast. And then uh, I guess the last thing again, you know, these 12 aren't the problem. If, if someone says the problem is so-and-so, whatever the place is, okay, then you get out there and, and take the pictures of that place and, and call TABC on them and give them a hard time. Because, you know, I'm licensed as a real estate broker. So if someone calls Trek on me, it's a pain. If someone calls TABC on, I'm going to use Mark because he's standing there, okay? He, it's a pain. He has to respond and everything. So if, if they get a call every week at, because you see it's an issue, you know, I'm sure you have enough time to make the call, right? And figure out how to do it. And maybe you might send that to 150 people and they might want to do it too. I don't know. But if they're not cooperating with these guys, then you know, deal with the three idiots, not the 16 people that are trying to bust their hump to help make it happen. Because this guy owns four, five, and you probably have, what, 12 bars represented here. So don't meet them. You know, get the people that are the problem. So I think I covered everything, and I appreciate it. And you all, thanks for being here. And the last call is going to be pretty soon. Oh, I'm kidding. Hey, hey real quick. Greg, thank you. And real quick, just to, um, to emphasize what he said when I, you know, I mentioned it was enforcement earlier. If, if you see someone breaking the law, you should call the police. If you see any of us that are on here that have pledged to do a thing and we aren't doing it, then you should call us. Um, I think it's important, and Mark had sort of mentioned this, nothing that we do is going to prevent bad stuff from happening. We can do all these things. Um, we could have 80 Bear County Sheriff's officers, and we are not going to prevent people from peeing in yards. That's, that's not going to happen. What I can promise you is that we can take the enforcement of it when it happens as seriously as you guys do. Good evening, everybody. My name is Aaron Benia. I am uh, the owner of the Squeeze Box. I've been a commercial leaseholder on St. Mary's for about seven years. I've been in operation for six years. Uh, both of my businesses reside in District 1, so I'm very familiar with these points we're touching on about the parking situation. And I just want to introduce myself and thank everybody for your time, your concerns, and I hope we can all work together to make it better. Hi, I'm Malika. I own TB8 up the street um, next to Sings. Great place. Great place. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to introduce myself if you have any questions. Hello, guys. My name is Alejandro Perez. I own Alejandro's Garden Patio. And um, definitely, thank you for hearing us out. We're definitely going to uh, make this good and collaborate to make it safer. Real quick, uh, you know, I think you brought up about new bars and not allowing the new places to come up and how you get involved in that, you, you have ways to, to get involved and if you don't want something, you can stop it, you know. Um, it, right, and there's, there's posts that they have to put, if it's a place that never had a liquor license, there's going to be a big white poster in the front and it's going to have the name of the corporation, and, and the DBA doing business as on there and, and if it's gonna help, uh, hold a liquor license. You can contact TBC, you can protest that kind of stuff. They're supposed to, each one of, one of us had to put out through media, a newspaper or something, notices and mail notices to everyone, I think it was uh, 200 feet uh, radius in the area and we had to mail them out. Most people think it's junk mail and they throw it, so they never really contest it. But there is things that you guys can do. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but if you contact Parker with your questions, he can get in touch with me, and I can give you an answer to give you guys what we can do about these things that we don't want to happen. You know, everybody's like, well, these things are these things are happening, but you know, I can give you some of my experience to prevent this from happening. I, I'm all about competition, the more the merrier, because it makes each one of us better, technically. But there is a congestion issue, like, yeah, I don't know if we can have more bars in here. You know, I mean, it's great that we have all these bars that we do now, but even more so, I think right now, until we resolve this, that's not really a good idea. Yeah. Me, personally, I don't think that's a good idea. This is kind of a uh, what if question for you, but 
as an association and you get a new business comes in. You know, you know they're coming, they start building. Would it be likely or could you pay them a visit, um, talk with them, explain to them what the history has been recently in the neighborhood and say, and kind of lay down the groundwork to say, we don't want this to happen again, so yes. can you put pressure, you know, a little pressure, I mean, as much as, you know. Yeah, realistically, I don't know how much pressure we can bring to bear on them. I think a lot of this is uh, selling them on the idea that, hey, we've got a good thing going, and let's keep it going. Uh, a lot of this, I mean, most, most, most business owners ultimately are going to be practical about their bottom line. And then all of this stuff is going to be good for everybody's bottom line long term. Last, last guy over here. Um, I can't blame the businesses. It's really a city planning problem. Um, you know, there's not much diversification in the nights and bars. So maybe these uh, business owners could maybe get together and maybe diversify their business a little bit. I mean, I can't tell me gin or whiskey tales is different at one bar from the other. So perhaps maybe we could have a microbrewery. Maybe we could have like a bodega. You know, there's, you know, I've lived in many different cities across the world, in many different neighborhoods, the walkable areas, and I've never seen so much violence and drunken behavior and in one place before. And it's, and it's not the, the business owner's fault, it's the city planning. They let it get out of hand so we've got 19 bars and no other types of businesses. I know uh, you have a lovely uh, bar road, lovely place. We need more stuff like that on the strip and maybe less Let's pause. Let's just go best part a little bit. Okay, no, I, I think that's a good. Okay, I think that's a great point. Unfortunately, our zoning does our zoning doesn't really help steer that sort of stuff in a planning sense. Um, I've actually mentioned this to a couple of people, and to the extent that, that you guys are interested, you know, Midnight Swim started as a restaurant called Cheese Bank, and financially it did not survive. Um, you, you guys probably noticed uh, the cookhouse, right? Which is in Tobin Hill, which was, in my mind, justifiably called the best restaurant in the city by the Express News. Um, it didn't make it, Peter and Susan are dear friends of mine. Um, Susan opened up a Cambodian noodle shop called Golden Bond. Um, it didn't make it. Full service sit down restaurants have had a really hard time surviving in this neighborhood to date, to 2022. I don't think that that will always be the case. Um, I think that the market will demand more cafes, bistros, restaurants over time as you see population density, as you see higher incomes. I think all that stuff is gonna come. It probably is gonna take a little bit of time. I can tell you that in my world, I, I have a restaurant called Barbaro, I have a bakery called Extra Fine, I have a restaurant called Hot Joy. Um, uh, restaurateurs would be very nervous about opening a restaurant on the strip today. Um, uh, as things come, I think that will change. The, the other thing that I would mention, um, we have made efforts to um, to sort of punctuate the bars that we are operating with some other things. So, for instance, like uh, Curry Boys and and where Pizza Party was. That's that, that's my project. You know, Curry Boys is I think the thing that this neighborhood would like to see more of a daytime food service operation that doesn't sell alcohol. Um, the adjacent building pizza party, we're turning that into a, a taco concept. It's, it's going to be the same sort of situation. Um, we, um, I, I, Aaron at, at Squeezebox, for example, last weekend uh, threw a shrimp boil, right, which was a very food-centric event. We've done food-centric events at Midnight Swim. We actually have a someone in residency doing a taqueria idea. I have the, the Airstream in front of Little Death. Um, is a, uh, a, a ex employee of mine who's doing his uh, restaurant there called Gigi's Deli, which is open during the day on the weekends. We're trying to do more food influence things, but they, they have to work financially. I, 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 I hope that you guys would see that as a gesture of good faith where we're not just trying to do bars after bars after bars. Right now, I do think there's a bit of a disconnect between what we, including me, what we would all like to see in terms of restaurants and the market's ability to support it. Um, but we're gonna keep trying, and I, I think it will get better. All right, it looks like we're, people, we're losing people. We're, people are dropping like 
overserved patrons on the strip, am I right? <laughs> All right, well, I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, you know, participation makes progress, and y'all's participation in business progress, I mean, business participation is, is, is what's gonna help. And we get, I know it's fatiguing. I mean, I took two blood pressure pills before. Like, I knew that I was gonna need, uh, mostly because I'm talking in front of all y'all. Um, so, you know, we just have to stay patient. I really think that there's a, another side of this, and it's gonna, probably gonna take a couple years. Um, so, uh, you know, we can we can stay angry, or we can or we can try and work towards a solution. And if you want to be angry, you can be angry at me, and I'll I'll try and filter filter it. I mean, uh, it's just. Uh, the, the constant yelling of individuals at each other is just, it's not gonna, it's not gonna produce anything other than hurt feelings. Uh, so, please, come yell at me if you want to.